This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much and thank you also for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I stand up here with some nervous, nervousness because I'm neither a historian and I'm not an archivist, um, but uh, Valerie was extremely persuasive in terms of encouraging me to come and speak. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the themes that have already been talked about in terms of shared, shared histories, an organisation um, trying to work in new ways, working with new communities. And, um, but what I'm also going to do, I hope, is just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of how some of those opportunities have also shaped us as an organisation in terms of how we work and how we deliver our work much more generally. And so some of the comments will be a little bit introspective as well as being um, talking about our broader work, um, working with a broad range of communities. Um, everything I'm going to talk about is collaborative. Um, I'll start off by uh, introducing the, the names that are here on the first slide. The work that I'm talking about has been driven by a vision which is really of the Society's director, Rita Gardner. Over the last five or six years, the impl implementation of that has really sat with me and, and, and two of my colleagues. Um, Steve Brace, who's the head of education and outdoor learning, and Alistair McLeod, who's the head of, 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 of collections. My role in the Society is I'm the head of research and higher education. So we have been working together, and I, hopefully you'll see some of the elements of that, as I talk about a program of work that we've been over to undertaking over the, um, the last 10 years. Many of you know, and in fact I can see some faces in the audience who are much more expert, in fact the person sitting right next to me is much more expert in terms of the Society's collections. Um, the RGS has an amazing uh, archive of the history of exploration, of geographical science, of the organisation, but also of many eminent individuals as well that you would associate with the history of exploration. Um, it's a history of empire, it's a history of colonialism. It has over two million items. The Society was founded in 1830 and has effectively been collecting materials uh, with various different collection strategies through that time. Um, and these are now uh, housed at, at the Society. Virtually all of the materials apart from the film is housed at the Society. What I've got up here is just a, a sort of a random selection. Well, they happen to be some of my favourites, but that's, 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 that, that's the theme behind these of materials, just to illustrate the, the range that, that, that the society holds. There are maps, photographs, films, paintings. There's also a, a whole range of artifacts, of materials, and I'll come back to that materiality and the importance of that in terms of our working, in terms of engaging with, with uh, communities. That was a theme that's been in both of the previous two, two presentations. So there's this incredibly rich, wonderful archive. Purportedly, there are two million items. Um, there's a lot. Um, and about half of those are, are maps. Some are digitised, um, many are not. The catalogue is largely online, although there is a, there is a period which is not, not yet online. The, um, kind of the, 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 the institutional backdrop for what I'm going to be talking about um, has really been kind of playing out over the last two decades. In 1995, the Royal Geographical Society merged with the Institute of British Geographers. Um, the two organisations had been together until the early 1930s, but at that stage the, the academic geographers, the IBG, um, to kind of uh, simplify a little bit, split off and created their own organisation. In 1995 the two organisations came back together after a fairly heated discussion and debate within the community. Um, and at that stage the director, Rita, was appointed. And as part of her vision for the society going forward, it was really about opening up the society, um, opening up its materials, opening up its membership, and opening up its, its buildings. So behind what I'm talking about is a program that had a physical manifestation, a building program, and also had a strategic direction, which has guided our work. And so those of you who've visited the RGS know that what happened was that kind of both literally and metaphorically, the society was reoriented. Rather than opening behind um, a large uh, sort of, uh, uh, can't quite think of the best way to describe it, but iron railings, it was reoriented to open onto Exhibition Road, where of course there's a huge foot traffic of individuals and the major institutions, um, the Science Museum, Natural History Museum, V&A, that sit on Exhibition Road. So there was a building programme, and that building programme, very, very importantly, involved creating the foil reading room, a new reading room, and more importantly, spaces, 
uh, appropriately climate controlled, where the collections could be curated and could be stored, um, materials could be digitized, records could be put online, and a wider public could access those particular materials. So that was the, the physical manifestation of that. That, that program of, of building and reorienting um, took, over, uh, took, took about five years, and the society um, reopened its archives, it unlocked its archives in 2004, and there's someone sitting on the front row who was, who was instrumentally um, involved in that. But what I'm really going to focus on is the program of work that's followed in terms of taking that opportunity of these materials greater opportunities for engagement with these materials to actually deliver on that. And I'm going to talk about two different themes which come together, I think, or are coming together um, today. So the first programme of work is a programme of work that was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. There were other funders too, uh, which was called Crossing Continents, Connecting Communities. Sorry, so I'm just, just getting used to the drill in the background. It's about, it's about like being at the RGS where the, the concrete hammers start on the pavement outside. So it was a programme of work that was really trying to engage different audiences with the society's collections, bringing, thank you very much, bringing new voices, bringing new faces, and most importantly, bringing new perspectives to the society's materials. Because as was very well illustrated in the last presentation, of course, a lot of the material that sits within the RGS archives has an awful lot to say about, um, obviously, global histories, but also local histories of many of the communities that now find themselves living in London. And so the program was a program of work with four London-based community groups, Afghan, Chinese, East African, and Punjabi, working with the society's collections, pulling out different elements, historical elements, geographical elements, about place, about migration, about landscape, about diaspora. The outputs were a series of exhibitions that were curated by Vandana Patel, um, that were housed at the society. Um, there are also traveling versions of these. The outputs were important, but what was more important for the society was the process, was the engagement with the community groups, the new voices, the new faces, the new perspectives, the new understandings that were brought, um, brought to bear. A very important element also of the uh, program of work was educational resources. Resources explicitly linked to the uh, Key Stage 2, Key Stage 3 specifications, um, both for geography and for history. Resources that were ready for teachers to be able to just download and use in the classroom with images, with exercises, with packs of materials. That program of work ran for three years, from 2006 to 2009. Where we've been taking the work subsequently um, is rather than the society leading on these projects, is the society supporting community groups to lead on these projects. So we've been helping in com with community groups in terms of writing their own funding bids. We've been providing space, we've been providing access to the collections. Um, this is an exhibition that actually happened at the society at the tail end of last year. It was led up by the Windrush Rush Foundation, Arthur Torrington. And as you can see, uh, the theme, it was, making the, it was about the 175th anniversary of the emancipation of uh, a million Africans in the Caribbean. So, so our focus has changed. Um, yes, um, we still have the kind of really thriving, exciting community groups in the society, but, but we're trying to take a facilitating role um, to, to encourage use of the collections um, by the community groups. That's in part resource-driven in terms of the challenges that we just talk, talked about in terms of staffing, but it's also, also a principal perspective in terms of how this work, work should be taken forward. The culmination of this um, last year was actually probably the best week for me in the society when we had a group of about 20 students um, from very different backgrounds, um, uh, in, in, in multiple different ways, um, not in, least in terms of their educational backgrounds, working on the collections, developing their own exhibition, which will be curated later this year in Birmingham. Equally important um, in terms of shaping the society's work is another kind of concurrent theme of work that we've been undertaking. And I did put this slide in before I realized it was going to be in the audience today. Uh, this is work where we have been engaging with academics, 
largely through funding from the AHRC, which a number of the organisations here are, are privileged to be able to, 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 to tap into. Also focused on bringing new interpretations to our collections, but drawing on the scholarly community um, to guide, to direct, to chart that new way through our uh, collections. And why this has been particularly important for the society, and this is where I'm going to get a little bit more introspective, is it really has shaped both how we do our work in terms of genuinely collaborating across departments and divisions, research, into collections, into education, and also into our work in public engagement. But it has also helped us shape and to, to, to kind of develop the narrative about how we talk about some sometimes quite difficult things in the organisation's past. The society's role, sorry, I, I, the society's role in terms of, um, as an agent of imperialism, of empire, and of colonialism. Hidden histories of exploration was all about telling the stories of the local inhabitants, the intermediaries um, in the history of exploration. Not just telling the stories of the David Livingstons um, or the Grants or the Speaks of the World, but talking about the local people, not just in terms of the physical labour that they brought, but their intellect, their guidance, their expertise that they brought to those expeditions. It did also involve a community element, and that was a very important part to us. And it was a kind of an innovative way of us working with the, uh, the academic community. I should have made it very clear right from the beginning, this, this project very much was led by uh, uh, Felix Driver from Royal Holloway. Um, it led to, a, to an exhibition, it led to an online exhibition. The website's just here. Take a two minute break and uh, I'll extend the time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> This does happen at the RGS, and it's normally a concrete rock uh, um, drill just outside the, the main Ondaatje Theatre, so I am using this elsewhere. I'll have a bit of extra time on the end, so just to... Okay. Uh, it's, uh, no, I'm, I'm not bad. Give it a minute for them to get round and start. <laughs> Okay, I, I am going to keep going because I'm conscious of time and I don't want to eat into other people's time. Um, so it, is, it, it manifests itself in terms of an exhibition, um, there was a book, there's an online gallery and I'd encourage you to have a look at that, that's, that's, still, that's still live. The current direction um, in which we're kind of bringing some of these streams together um, are through the AHRC programs, both the Connected Communities program where we undertook a piece of scoping work in collaboration with some colleagues at Queen Mary, looking at how the society's collections really could connect communities, could tell stories of diaspora and trans transnationality. And also, currently, through the AHRC Collaborative Doctoral Partnership Program, we were very, very lucky to receive a cohort of studentships with the Royal Society. And so we have a series now of PhD students who are working with the society on the collections on a range of the different materials um, that, that, that exist, the film, the instruments, the materials, um, and take, um, the, bringing them together, I'm sorry, I apologize, I am distracted, bringing them together um, in terms of one studentship which we are actually just starting this year, we're advertising right now, which is explicitly trying to bring these two themes together. The expertise of the academic community, the scholarly insights, the value that brings, working with communities and specifically have a studentship on diaspora and place and the role that collections such as the Royal Geographical Society can play in things like family histories and those shared histories that were talked about in the two previous presentations. So good luck to the next speaker. <laughs>